Good morning. My name is Taylor Sutton. I'm one of the pastors here. This morning, we are continuing our series in the book of James. So I invite you now to turn with me to James chapter 5. morning we'll be considering James chapter 5 verses 1 through 6. James 5, 1 through 6. Please follow along as I read. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Will you pray with me? Mighty Father, we receive your word this morning through your servant James. We pray that you would humble us, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, give us hearts that are open to what you have to teach us and how you might change us. And we pray that you would do that. Through Jesus. Amen. Well, as long as there have been humans, there have been rich humans and poor humans. The details shift over time and from place to place. The numbers vary. The storylines are numerous, but the constant is that human societies tend to be made up of a few with a lot, a lot with a little, and both groups have to figure out how to coexist together. They need each other. I would say even the emergence of a large middle class over the last several centuries has not really alleviated this fundamental human problem. How do people with a lot and people with a little live together, coexist? Many solutions have been proposed for this, both political solutions, economic solutions. But as we come and consider and sit under James chapter 5 this morning, what James has to tell us is not just one more political or economic solution to this age-old problem. Instead, what James wants us to do is to consider this problem of wealth and poverty against the backdrop of redemptive history. What I mean by that is the Bible says that human history has a central figure, and it has an ending. The central figure is Jesus Christ, crucified, raised, and reigning over the world. The ending is Christ's return, when he will come to make all things right and fully establish his kingdom. 
So the question that I'm inviting us to, to think about this morning as we look at James 5, verses 1 through 6, is how do the social realities of wealth and poverty, how do they look differently when we view them as embedded in the story of Jesus? Or, to put the question in a slightly less abstract form, what difference does it make for your relationship with money and with other people that Jesus is Lord? That's the question that James is answering. So James 5, 1 through 6, is made up of three movements, and we're going to work our way through these three movements and consider what God has to say to us through James. So the first movement is that judgment is coming for certain rich people. The second movement says that their money, these rich people that James is talking about, their money will not save them from judgment. And then in the third movement, James says that these people who he's talking about deserve judgment. So that's the outline for how we'll walk through this text. Judgment is coming for certain rich people. That's movement one. Their money will not save them, and they deserve the coming judgment. So let's start with the first one. Judgment is coming. Specifically, judgment is coming for the unrighteous rich. Judgment is coming for the unrighteous rich. Look at verse 1. James says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. So James addresses a group that he calls you rich. Now the question is, who is he talking to? There are really two options. The first option is that he's addressing wealthy Christians, people who presumably would have been in the assembly that heard this letter read. The second option is that he's addressing unbelieving, non-Christian, unrighteous rich people. And I think the evidence points pretty strongly to the second option, that he's addressing the unrighteous rich. I'll just give you one piece of evidence, and it's from James chapter 2. If you flip back just a page or two, James 2, verse 6, James says this. He says, are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called. That's James 2, 6, and 7. As we look at James 5, 1 through 6, and, and we look at the descriptions that follow verse 1, which we'll come to in a moment, it seems that he's talking about the same group of people. So what emerges is this picture of a group of wealthy landowners who were taking advantage of uh, certain poor people in their community. And among those poor people were at least some Christians, Christians whom James writes this letter to. Now, one objection to that or one question would be, well, if he's talking to unrighteous rich people, non-Christians, why does he here address them directly? Why does he speak to them in the second person if they wouldn't even be in church to hear this? And I think the reason is that he's adopting a mode of address that's actually somewhat common in the Old Testament prophets. If you look at prophets like Isaiah, for example, there are passages in Isaiah where Babylon or the king of Babylon will be addressed directly, even though the king of Babylon is never going to read the book of Isaiah. The, the, the audience is Israel, even though someone else is rhetorically addressed. We have a similar convention even today with uh, the form of an open letter. An open letter is addressed to someone formally, but its audience is actually a different group, usually the general 
public. So James is speaking to this group of non-Christian wealthy landowners who his audience knows very well, and he's rebuking them in the hearing of his believing audience. Now look at what he says. So he says, come now, you rich. What is his announcement to them? Verse 1 says, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Fundamentally, what James is announcing to the unrighteous rich is that judgment is coming. So when he talks about miseries here, he's not talking about an economic downturn or a a bad crop. He is talking about the final judgment. When the Lord Jesus returns to make all things right, he will punish and remove evildoers. And James declares to these unrighteous rich people that they are in that group and that judgment is coming. Now we might ask, what are James's actual hearers supposed to do with this? Or to ask it a different way, why does he say this? Why does he have this whole paragraph uh, railing against unrighteous rich people in a letter to Christians, many of whom were actually poor and being mistreated by these rich people. What does he expect them to take away from this? Well, two things, I think, are clear. He wants to say implicitly to Christians, don't give up under the mistreatment of the unrighteous rich. And he wants to say to them, secondly, don't envy or imitate the unrighteous rich. So as we go through this paragraph, he's speaking rhetorically to these unrighteous rich people, but I think all along the implied twofold message to Christians is don't give up and don't be like them. So I want you to keep that that twofold implicit message message in mind as we continue through this text. So we've covered the first movement, verse 1, judgment is coming for the unrighteous rich. Now, second, James says, their money will not save them from judgment. The wealth of the unrighteous rich will not save them from the judgment that is coming. And we see this in verses 2 and 3. Let's read those two verses again. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. So in all these statements, what James is is driving at is that their wealth is failing them. He describes their possessions as already having rotted. Their fine garments have already become moth-eaten. Their gold and silver have corroded. What he's talking about is actually, technically, literally, a future reality. But the future reality is so certain that James can describe it as having already begun. So though it's undiscernible to these rich individuals, their substantial resources are already failing them. Not only are they failing them, verse 3 says, their riches will actually turn against them. He says, the corrosion of your gold and silver will be evidence against you. It will testify against you. The idea there could be that simply the exorbitant amount of gold and silver that they have hoarded will itself serve as a testimony to their greed and selfishness. At any rate, what is clear is that when the judgment comes, their wealth 
will not help them. Look at how he puts it at the very end of verse 3. You have laid up treasure in the last days. So all of their scheming and striving and oppression and accumulation, it has all taken place unbeknownst to them in the shadow of the last days. Christ will come and they will give an account and their money will not help them. Look, if you play Monopoly and you win, congratulations, you won, but you will not be able to take your accumulated Monopoly wealth and go make a payment on your mortgage. Now, that doesn't mean that Monopoly is not real, like you really did win. Within the parameters of the game, you actually accumulated the most. The problem is that that game exists in a much wider world into which you cannot transfer the gains of Monopoly. And and there's something similar that happens with earthly wealth. There are very real benefits to wealth. It provides status, security, comfort, power. There's no denying that these are real benefits of wealth, but what verses 2 and 3 are saying is those benefits are temporary in duration, and they are limited in scope. A day is coming when the benefits of wealth will become zero. When the Lord Jesus comes, the greatest fortunes amassed by the mightiest kings and barons will count for absolutely nothing. The only thing that can help us before the judgment seat of the holy creator of the universe is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Dying to pay for our wrongdoings, rising for our vindication, that is our only hope before the judgment seat of God. Money cannot save us. So the first movement, judgment is coming for these unrighteous rich. Their money will not save them from judgment. And now we come to the third movement. They deserve this judgment. They deserve the judgment that is coming. So James announces it. He tells them their money won't help them. And now he he ends by bringing forward the charges against them. What is it that they have done that warrants divine judgment? We see this in verses 4 through 6. Look at verse 4. Behold, James says, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. So James puts forward three accusations, three great injustices that these rich people have committed. The first one is, They have defrauded their workers of wages. That's verse 4. Verse 5, second, they have spent their money excessively on themselves. And verse 6, they have used the power of their wealth to persecute and harm righteous people. This, James says, is why they deserve to be punished, to be judged, to be held accountable. Now, this indictment teaches us a couple really important things. First thing it teaches us is that James is not saying that money or even being wealthy is inherently bad. What's bad is using wealth 
to sin. Uh, Kevin DeYoung, uh, pastor and theologian, says this in his book, Impossible Christianity. He says, the Bible is emphatically against the normal way rich people view and use their money. The Bible is not against wealth and possessions as such. It's a great summary, I think, of the, of the tension we see when we look across the whole Bible for all the things it says about money, possessions, and wealth. There are a lot of warnings and indictments like this text. The Bible, DeYoung says, is emphatically against the normal way that rich people view and use their money. The Bible is not against wealth and possessions as such. However, before we rush to take comfort in the fact that the Bible is not against money and possessions as such, we should also take note of the danger, the danger that DeYoung describes as the normal way that rich people view and use their money. And it's the same danger that James is alerting us to in this text. And we could think of it this way, that, that even though wealth is not inherently bad, it is uniquely tempting to be in possession of much wealth is by definition to be vulnerable to particular temptations. There's nothing wrong with having a bucket full of water balloons. It's morally neutral. However, if you give a person a bucket full of water balloons, they will immediately start scanning the horizon for someone dry and unsuspecting. Thoughts that would not have occurred to them without a bucket of water balloons. Now, is it the, the fault of the water balloons? No. It's simply the fact that being in possession of certain capacities opens the door to certain temptations. Look, Every single one of us is driven by a profound self-interest. Rich, poor, everyone in between. But what the Bible alerts us to is that having a lot of money gives you the ability to overrule other people's self-interest in favor of your own. And that reality, just on its own, is tempting. And so James, as he brings his charges against these unrighteous rich, we would do well to consider the ways that we are tempted to behave like them. But again, in their case, they have not merely been tempted. They have indulged in the dark possibilities of wealth. And so we've seen judgment is coming for the unrighteous rich. That's verse 1. We've seen that their money will not save them from judgment, verses 2 and 3. And then we've seen in verses 4 through 6 that they deserve judgment for what they have done. So I think we are now in a, in a position to try and summarize what James is saying about wealth and poverty and the story of Jesus. Let me summarize it like this. Money is dangerous for people who have less of it and for people who have more of it, but Jesus is Lord over all. Money is dangerous for people who have less of it and for people who have more of it, but Jesus is Lord over all. We see in James 5, 1 through 6, that to have less money is to be vulnerable to being mistreated, oppressed, taken advantage of. We also see that to have more money is to be vulnerable to the soul-destroying temptations of wealth. And we also get a few subtle hints of the difference it makes to approach all of this under the mighty and kind authority of the risen Christ. 
So to try and unpack what this means for us, how do we actually apply this? How do we live this out? I want to go back to those two implied messages to Christians that I mentioned a few minutes ago. The messages of don't give up under mistreatment by the unrighteous rich and don't try to be like the unrighteous rich. So let's consider both of those in light of the story of Jesus, the kingship of Jesus, his great and kind authority. So first, don't give up under the mistreatment of the unrighteous rich. Look, all of us can think of people and institutions that have more leverage over us than we do over them. And it is certainly the case for some, if not many in this room, that sometimes those people or those institutions use that leverage, that power, those resources in such a way that's not fair, in such a way that unjustly harms us. Maybe for you, it's your employer. Maybe it's a larger competitor. Maybe it's one of the many faceless bureaucracies that we have to deal with in daily life. Maybe it's a teacher. Maybe it's a a boss. Maybe it's a coach. When we find ourselves mistreated by people with more resources and more power than us, we are tempted to lash out in kind or to despair, to give up hope. We can also be tempted to look somewhere else to find some other person, some patron, some other institution that will fight for us and defeat the person or institution that's harming us. And and here's the thing. If you're being mistreated, it is good and right to pursue whatever avenues you have for redress, for recourse, to, to try and resist and push back on those injustices. But what James is telling us is that our ultimate hope, our our bedrock confidence must be in Christ. Look at what he says in verse 7. This is, in a sense, the takeaway of the passage that we've been looking at. Verse 7 says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. So therefore, in light of everything that James has just said to the unrighteous rich, the takeaway for Christians who are being mistreated by them is be patient until the coming of the Lord. Think about Jesus. Jesus suffered immense mistreatment in his death. And yet Jesus was gloriously vindicated in his resurrection. And so we now wait for his return, at which point he will hold everyone accountable. The risen Jesus is the king. He is the final arbiter of all matters on earth and in heaven. So there is no injustice, there is no unresolved loose end in this age that will not be profoundly resolved by the coming of Christ. And so we who belong to him, whatever proper means we might take to push back against the injustices done against us, that must be where our ultimate hope resides, that we belong to Jesus Jesus is Lord, and he is coming back. So don't give up under mistreatment by the unrighteous rich. The second implied takeaway or exhortation is don't be like the unrighteous rich. Even the poorest person sitting and listening to James's letter read maybe for the first time, even the poorest of those Christians could have been tempted to envy 
the unrighteous rich, to think if only I had what they had, my life would be better. And one of the things James is telling them through this text is you do not want to be like them. In the end, you do not want to be like them. And if that's true of the poorest Christians, how much more should we heed James's implied warning when we, many of us, have enough wealth to not merely envy rich people who are unrighteous, but to imitate them? We must watch out for the temptations of wealth. On any given day, you probably do not feel very rich. That's just kind of the way psychology works. I don't know why. But here's the reality. If you have more than you need to survive, and you have more than most people, you are rich. And if you think about the people in this room, globally, we check off both boxes. We have more than we need to survive, and we have more than most people. So you and I, most likely, we are rich Christians. So we would do well to not rush past the implied warning that James 5, 1 through 6 provides for us. The temptations of wealth, if you boil down at least what James highlights, you could say that the temptations of wealth are to indulge yourself and take advantage of other people. That's basically what his indictment in verses 4 through 6 can be distilled down into. These unrighteous rich people are indulging themselves and they are taking advantage of people with less ability to resist them. So we would do well to consider where do we feel the temptation to those two things. I was struck this week by a comment that New Testament scholar Doug Moo said about this passage. He said, uh, he's, he's an American trains American pastors, he says, in the Western world, where amassing material wealth is not only condoned, but admired, we Christians need to come to grips with this point in James and ask ourselves seriously, when do we have too much? When do we have too much? When Are we spending too much of our money on ourselves? When have we saved up enough for the future? If you look at verse 5, James says to these unrighteous rich, you have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have overspent, you have overinvested, James says, in your own comforts. If we are maxing out our standard of living up to the limits of what our income allows, we are resembling the unrighteous rich of James chapter 5. Consider as well, how do we treat people who have less than us? Our employees, the people who serve us at grocery stores and restaurants. How do we treat people in poverty in general? James 5 warns us against using our resources in such a way that harms them or degrades them, or ignores their suffering. Christians ought to be the kind of people who, in appropriate ways, in ways that are fitting for their situation, help people around them. If you look at Proverbs 11.10, Proverbs 11.10 says, when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. Let me read that one more time. Proverbs 11.10, when it goes well with the righteous, the city 
rejoices. In other words, to be part of the people of God means that, let me put it this way, Christians who become wealthy should have a noticeably positive impact in the communities where they live. When it goes well with the righteous, the community around them should notice it because they're benefiting from it. It's actually causing the city, the community, to rejoice when things go well for God's people. And the reason that we can live this way is the same reason why we can endure mistreatment by the unrighteous rich. It's because Jesus is Lord. Look at verse 4. The end of verse 4 says, The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. What a statement. The cries of these powerless, vulnerable, invisible farm workers have reached the ears of the God of heaven's armies. What a sobering thought. And for Christians, we rejoice that we are saved by grace, but we are also accountable to the one who has saved us by grace. We will answer for what we have done with what he has given us. Jesus Christ is not your or my personal assistant existing to maximize our efficiency and our productivity and our ease. Jesus Christ is the Lord of heaven's armies. And he hears your prayers. Praise God for that. But he also hears the prayers of the poor and the destitute and the exploited. And our stewardship of our money ought to reflect our awareness of that reality. And so, money is dangerous. It's dangerous for those who have less of it. It's dangerous for those who have more of it. But praise be to God that Christ is Lord over all. And so we don't just recite that as a platitude, we go out into the world, into our jobs and our neighborhoods, making decisions, and we make decisions with our money and with other people in light of the fact, the good news that Jesus Christ, who was dead and now is alive, is King. He is Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we rejoice In your kingship, we take refuge in it. And at the same time, Lord, we we want to take stock of our own lives and the ways that we continue to live out of step with that reality. We pray you would forgive us for the ways that we have done that, the ways that we have used our wealth in ways that deny your lordship, the ways that we have acted as if you are not king, you are not listening, you are not coming back. Would you renew in us a more vibrant faith in you? Would you deepen our confidence that you are coming back, that history is not a meaningless cycle of chaos, but that it is a story with you at the center and your return at the end to make all things new and to put all things right. Help us to believe that more. And would you give us the grace to let that belief affect how we live? We need your help. We need the Holy Spirit. And so we ask you, Lord Jesus, to give us that help in your grace and in your mercy and in your mighty power. Amen.